Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator for this morning's first panel, on-air editor for CNBC, John Fort. And now, please welcome our panelists. First, the chairman and CEO of Showtime Networks, Matt Blank. Next, the chairman and CEO of Comcast Corporation, Brian Roberts. The president and CEO of Charter Communications, Tom Rutledge. And the chairman and CEO of Eris, Bob Stanzioni. Well, first of all, uh, thank you guys for uh, joining me on this panel. Very timely one. Um, oh, looks like we got a good sized audience, too. So let's address the elephant in the room right off the bat. Uh, Brian, Matt was telling me his broadband speeds at home last week dropped by about half, so I don't know. No, but seriously. Um, <laughs> uh, Comcast is in the midst of, of attempting a historic merger with uh, Time Warner Cable. And uh, Charter Communications, um, Tom, a month ago, didn't mince words uh, describing how bad you thought the deal was for consumers. Uh, partly you said, from the regulatory perspective, it's difficult to imagine a transaction that could concentrate the industry more than the proposed Comcast merger. This isn't you specifically, but uh, a filing from, from Charter pointing out uh, the concentration, uh, 33 million TV subscribers, which is now going to be less because of a spinoff. But tell me, er earlier this week, there was a transaction where Comcast agreed to spin off some subscribers, including some to, to Charter. Does that entirely make this now a good deal in your eyes? I do think it's a great deal. And I think it's a good deal for the industry. I think it's a great deal for Comcast. I think it's um, great for Charter. Uh, and I think it changes the landscape. And it's a different deal than I was describing previously. But what, what took it from and, bad to good exactly? Pardon me? What took it from bad to good exactly? Say that again? What, <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened that took it from bad to good over the past oh, few weeks? It, well, you know, it's a smaller deal from Comcast's perspective. And, uh, and I think that from an organization of the industry perspective, it's a much better outcome, I think, because we'll be able to compete both companies better as a result of the way the assets are deployed around the country. I think it's good for the employees of the companies. Um, I think both companies are committed to serving the communities and serving their employees and serving their customers in a dynamically positive way. And, uh, you know, I grew up, I spent uh, 23 years at Time Warner Cable. I have enormous respect for the people that work there and the quality of the people there. And uh, I think that all of the people in Time Warner will be ending up in great companies. I think the people that are moving from Charter and Comcast into different organizations will all end up in, in a better, more efficient industry that's committed to being successful. Hmm. Uh, Brian, uh, Al Franken has been pretty outspoken uh, in the Senate ab about how he feels about this deal. He doesn't like it, points out uh, reasons why, including, he says, the impact on consumers. Um, most people on an individual level just know their experience calling up the cable company trying to get something, whether it's a lower price or you know, a problem with their service. What can Comcast do to win the customer better? I mean, we we've seen the numbers. What, what can we do? Well, first of all, um, just in the first question you asked, when you net all of this out, for Comcast, we're buying 7 million net customers. Okay. So in the, um, in the world we live in, um, we saw Facebook's earnings last week. They have a billion, 200 million people around the world using Facebook. Uh, Netflix just hit 35 plus million. We're getting 7 million more customers. So a little bit, I, I agree totally with what Tom said about trying to give the industry a better opportunity to have a footprint regionally, 
and hopefully nationally that can compete and innovate better. So to your question, I think if you go out to the show, you'll see our X1 platform, which I think is a game changer. And being able to take the brains of that experience that for 50 years has been in a box and move it to the cloud, to state-of-the-art technology, and be able to click a remote control and as fast as you can normally just communicate with a box, now go to Denver and back in the same amount of time, which is mind-boggling, and therefore have or wherever in the cloud you might be going, is going to give consumers better services, better features, and there's no question there, in my opinion, there are real public benefits for consumers in making the scale and the innovation and the service better with these larger clusters. Okay. Okay. Matt, um, from Showtime's perspective, you, you provide content. You've got Showtime Anytime, uh, which is a play in the streaming game. Um, these apps, along with HBO Go, very Im uh, important and popular with consumers these days. How do you see a transaction like the one that the operators are working on now, how that affects you? Because right now, uh, for instance, Roku won't, won't work with streaming over Comcast. It will over Time Warner Cable. We'll see how it all plays out if the merger goes through. Will it work? Will it not work? I mean, does that matter to you? Sure, it matters to us. You know, first of all, it's great to be up here with the entire cable industry now. Uh, <laughs> my uh, the biggest benefit we see is that my T&E is going to go down. Uh, but, uh, you know, look, we have great relationships with Charter, with Comcast. Uh, the business is evolving very quickly, uh, as is this app world. Uh, the use of technology to better serve our customers is very important to us. It's a dialogue we have constantly with all of our customers, not just Charter or, or Comcast. Uh, I think there will be situations like that that will take some time to work themselves out. Uh, from our standpoint, our standpoint, we try to focus on the brand, what we're delivering to consumers, and using the technology, whatever that technology is, is available to us among you know, diverse pl platforms, and there will be more distribution platforms in the future, uh, to make sure that our, our customers get our product when and where they want it. You, know, you talk a lot about the cloud. Sometimes I get frustrated because the cloud is not a brand. It's something that exists over there and you know, may help somebody sitting with an iPhone or an iPad uh, use Showtime the way they want to use it. And that's how we feel about a lot of this technology. And we want to see these guys uh, have all that technology available to us as a content provider so we can better serve our customers. If I might, I, I would just add, if I could, that if you look three years ago, four years ago, how many different ways there were to get Showtime versus 2014 and to see Homeland and all the great content that you produce and the platforms that it's on, the competitiveness, the, the rapid way it's all changing. If you step back, we just saw this with the Olympics. Four years ago, there wasn't a tablet and there was tremendous content available on all platforms. So there's always going to be a specific case. What about this? What about that? But the trend of what technology is doing and how much I think each company finds a way to embrace it, support it, and innovate on it. I look at Twitter's role as helping uh, and social media change the way people hear about things, consume television. There's a, there's a lot of positives for a consumer and a ways to consume that have never or haven't been there all these years. And you go back 10 years, 20 years, it looks like a different planet. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so about that, let's bring in hardware. Bob uh, Aris, as, as many people know, but some people might not know, uh, has big customers in Comcast, Charter, Time Warner Cable, Verizon. You recently uh, bought the Motorola home business uh, from Google. Um, you were telling me and, and investors that you see opportunity in the increased broadband speeds and the demand that that's going to put um, on equipment like the type that you sell. But, but talk a little bit about some of these consumer hardware pieces we see, like Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Roku boxes that are, that are coming in, taking some of the role that the set-top box alone used to occupy. Uh, is that a threat because consumers are looking to the interface there? They're choosing those, uh, perhaps? Or is there some opportunity there for you? Well, there's 
there's both a threat and an opportunity. Uh, and if you're talking about the threat to my business or the threat to uh, Brian and, and Tom's business, it may be a little bit different. But we view those devices as additive to our, our business because we supply both the broadband platform, the CMTS, and the, the uh, gigabit speed products that we're investing in now as a platform for those devices to exist. Uh, for the most part, they plug into a box that a cable provider or a telco provides, and they uh, are, are streaming traffic over their networks. So for the most part, I think they're additive to what we do as opposed to a threat to what we do. There's no reason, by the way, that those, the functions of those boxes couldn't be incorporated into the platforms that the cable operators and the telcos are using today. In fact, that's going on already. Uh, it's a matter of business arrangements, not a matter of technology. Hmm. Well, in fact, the boxes we're buying from Aris are really capable of being traditional set-top boxes and being modern IP devices at the same time. And in many cases, they have all the wireless functionality built into them. And as our networks evolve, we can take that network in places that an individual piece of equipment can't go. Well, well but can I actually sure. ask a question of Bob, if that's allowed? Break the format for a second? Sure, boss. Job? No, no. OK, this, <laughs> so this wasn't planned. No, you so the chairman of the FCC was talking about AT&T and their, their gigabit speed. Our networks, as you see our future in speeds and capacities, and the, what, what are, I mean, we did a demo of a couple, over two gigabits uh, a couple, 18, years, ago. A couple years ago. What does the industry have to do to continue to be the leader and accept the competitive challenge that is the real world that we, that we live in? Yeah, so the industry's investing enormous sums of money. We're investing, uh, this year we'll invest over a half billion dollars in R&D, and a lot of that R&D is going into what we've been calling DOCSIS 3.1 technology, which we're now going to begin calling gigasphere technology. Uh, announcement went out about that yesterday. So enormous investments being made. If you went to our booth, and I, and I know a number of your folks did yesterday, you could see our DOCSIS 3.1 demo downloading one gigabit. And what the industry has to do is simply allocate the bandwidth to do that. And that's what you've done, what, what Tom's doing, and many others are doing by deploying all digital and sweeping away enough space on the network to bond channels to allow for uh, one gigabit service. The chip vendors are investing a lot in developing the chips for the devices in the home that will be able to ingest and, and uh, transmit uh, one gigabit service. I think that sometime towards the end of 2015, those, equipment will be, those equipments will be available and will begin to offer that service, or you will be able to uh, offer those services. Now, I, I'm concerned about the consumer experience in all this, and I know this came up at a panel yesterday talking about TV everywhere and how difficult it is for some consumers to actually get it to work. Uh, when is the consumer's day in all of this, where this technology not just sort of exists, but comes together in a way that delights them? What, what does the industry need to do? Well, is it more... Apple store type locations where they get hands-on help. What is it? Matt? There's always going to be new technology, so I don't know if you ever hit that, that point. But you know, Tom, uh, Chairman Wheeler in his remarks said something that I took an exception to. You know, we were, we were for many, many years a have-not company. And I, we're certainly a have network now, but we're not incumbents. Uh, we view ourselves as insurgents. And I think one thing about this industry is that most successful companies, either on the dist distributor side or on the content side, have viewed themselves as insurgents. And well, who that are the insurgency, then, if not, if well, I'm, I'm just talking talking about how we view ourselves because I think okay. if you view yourself as an incumbent, you're finished. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, part of that insurgency is accepting the fact that all these technology changes are going to happen. You know, look, we get frustrated. I thought John's remarks yesterday about his difficulties in accessing TV. Every I, I had that experience recently where I was told to go look at the back of the modem and, and read the number on the sticker. Uh, you know, we live in a world where, you know, you could have a fortune invested in a hedge fund and call them up and they'd send you a new password, you know, 
in two minutes, they'd ask you a security question, and, you, and you're back on, online to get your K1 or something. So, <laughs> so those are real, 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 real problems. But uh, we just want to stay ahead of it. And uh, developing apps wasn't our core competence. It's becoming our core competence. Uh, developing things that allow us to take advantage of the technology that distributors are putting in the, in the marketplace, either our current distribution world or a future distribution world, is absolutely critical to us because we want all of this to be, you know, consumers shouldn't know any, uh, any of our issues or any of our problems. They should just know how to get Showtime on any device that they have, whenever they want it, and then there's going to be a lot more Showtime subscribers. Brian um, and, and Tom specifically, it used to be there was your connection at home, there was your connection at work. Wireless has changed that. We're expecting a wearables revolution. Uh, it's going to change that even more. We've got Android Wear coming out. Everybody's expecting an Apple Watch. We'll see if we get it before the end of the year. What's the operator's play there? Do you need to make bigger moves into wireless networks, into selling those, MVNO, something like that, uh, in order to have a more established presence before wearables sort of take off without you? Okay, I can't let the K1 hedge fund <laughs> slip by. It's just too much talking about Matt. you. Okay, yeah. Matt. That's your biggest customer service problem. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're taking our innovation and trying to apply it to service. I think it's a very fair question on uh, where, how do you make it easier for consumers? And I think wireless is a big part of that answer. So it, it's not silos anymore. It's one experience. It has to work on every device. I don't know whether wearables are the next big thing and we're gonna watch TV on our wristwatch or, or not, but we need to be ready for all types of consumers, going from my folks who don't wanna do all these new things to my kids who absolutely do and everybody in between. And um, if you can put an advertisement out for our, our booth out there, come see the X1 platform, we view it as a platform. We view the platform as an asset, and it can go where the consumer wants to go. And I want to see my shows from Showtime, and, and different people will view how to get that differently. I think we've made great progress on TV everywhere. Getting the rights, we now have over 50 live channels, 25,000 pieces of content available on any platform, and the interface is easy. You don't need a box. It's a new world. And that didn't, we couldn't do that 24 months ago, let alone maybe even 12 months ago. And we're on that march to make it easier for consumers. Our customer service, we're taking that same innovation. You won't have to give us the ID off the modem. You're gonna be able to take your, we have it now, my uh, account app. You take it right on your iPhone. You push a button, it finds that modem. It says, you want me to reboot it for you? Click the button, it happens. Didn't fix it. Would you like an installer? We'll come out, pick your appointment, we're on our way, we'll text you. That is what the world expects, all kidding aside. And that's the standard that we're trying to push ourselves to get to. Five years from now, does Comcast need to own a wireless network? I think Wi-Fi is a huge asset for this industry. And over that kind of period, and with the FCC's new allocation of Wi-Fi spectrum, which is critical, and in the five gigs, and to be able to have faster Wi-Fi, right now in-home Wi-Fi is a lot slower than a gig. So if you bring it into the house fast, you better distribute it around the house fast and the neighborhood. And I think we will be involved in making access to your wireless device somehow, whether it's through another wireless company, through Wi-Fi, or some combination thereof. So a mesh Wi-Fi network, perhaps. We're that working on it. It's, it's a, to me, it reminds me of the period before we went into telephony. Right. We knew phone was, there was only one provider, and it was a real opportunity. Some people went in with circuit switch. Some waited for voice over IP. Some waited for startups to do it. Some waited for Cisco's equipment, Bob's company. And so I don't know the exact answer sitting here today, but I think it is a great something like 75% of all the bits going over wireless networks in 24 months will be over Wi-Fi in the country. And I've, I've neglected you over there, Bob. Is that an opportunity for you if, if the in-home broadband equipment becomes like a cell tower 
in the future, providing not just Wi-Fi access inside the house, but high-speed access to the whole neighborhood? Is that, is that an area where you could play? Absolutely. It's, uh, it, it, Wi-Fi is just a booming area right now in, in all aspects. The, the metro Wi-Fi, where we supply uh, the industry with, with the metro Wi-Fi equipment that is going in uh, so rapidly across the country, as well as in-home Wi-Fi. And the technology is changing very quickly. And uh, the, the area that we're investing in uh, that I think is pretty interesting right now is Wi-Fi assurance to look inside the home or look at the experience that the Wi-Fi user is, uh, is feeling and uh, being able to improve that experience and allow the, uh, the consumer to actually maybe control the experience in the home. Say uh, mom and dad are watching their 4K TV over a Wi-Fi stream, uh, through a Wi-Fi stream, and the kid comes home and plugs in their, their PlayStation. You, want, you may want to allow the family to decide which screen gets the priority uh, in those very high usage cases. I know we've got to wrap up. Uh, Tom, I want to give you the last word. Uh, taking, a, again, out five years uh, from now, what's going to be that pivotal technology that's driving innovation at that point? Is it going to be a box in the house? Is it still right. going to be uh, the smartphone? What do you see? Well, I, you know, I wish I knew. Uh, but the, the rea you know, Brian's uh, reality is correct. And it, it's interesting to hear another cable operator describe the market because it's accurate. You know, we serve, we're a service business. We serve everyone, every imaginable person that, uh, can be described in the country subscribes to our services. So we're not in the business of being the latest thing from a consumer electronics point of view, and yet we have to live in that world and service that world. And uh, that's the burden of our business, and it's the challenge of our business and the excitement of our business. And so I think we'll continue to follow that product curve. And it's already true, by the way, that the majority of data consumed on smartphones is actually consumed in the home or office on Wi-Fi networks that are connected to our networks. So we're the biggest wireless provider in the country already as an industry. And yet, we're doing it on unlicensed Wi-Fi spectrum with very small cells in the home and out now in public. And, and so I think that the convergence of a Wi-Fi delivery system with a really powerful um, wireline network is really our future. And I think it distinguishes us from our competitors and gives us a better future than uh, anyone I can imagine. But there's a lot of execution risk in that strategy and uh, a lot of work to do. But I'm confident that uh, our business has got a great future. Well, I know uh, Qualcomm Chairman Paul Jacobs has mentioned exactly that to me as well. So lots of the titans in, in technology and operators, hardware, content looking to this future. Thank you guys so much for being good sports and for all your insights here this morning. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.